Well, we know that forgiveness is important. We say that, we sing that, we proclaim that. But you know what? We don't practice it very well. Now, we know it's important because when people get ready to die, they want to do serious things. And so when we get to the five things that you're supposed to say to someone who's dying, watch what two of them say. I love you, thank you, goodbye, forgive me, I forgive you. Wow, two out of five relate to forgiveness. Another thing that's important is they say when you're with a dying person, you're supposed to be available to the things they need and want. And one of the most important things they suggest that you be there for is so that that person can have a chance to sort of reminisce about their life, particularly reminisce about those things where they messed up, where they did wrong, where they harmed someone, to somehow because although they didn't before have the opportunity to unburden themselves from something that's been weighing on them for a long, long time. Now, it's unfortunate that when we think about forgiveness, we always think about the F word. Forgot. Forget. Well, don't we? Don't we always hook forgiveness with forget? That's backwards, folks. It is backwards. I know God says, I forgive you and I will remember your sin no more. But that's God. That's not you and me. Besides, the Bible is not consistent with that. God doesn't forget all the sins. He didn't forget the sin of Adam and Eve. He didn't forget the sin of King David. He didn't forget of the woman in adultery. He did not forget. But he forgave. We have this idea that first we must forget. Well, you know what? If you forget, then you have said it's about me here. This forgiveness business. And you have said no to the very person that makes forgiveness available to us, who stands behind it, and who we in the Christian church look at when we talk about forgiveness. It's all about who? Jesus. Now I'm guessing that if you and I were someplace and you did something harmful and I lost my arm, I don't think I'd ever be able to forget what happened. But in God's grace, I might and could and should maybe find a way to forgive you. This is how it works. Okay, so you're a member of a church. And one of the leaders of the church in a meeting who takes care of the money says your name and says, I'm sorry, folks, to report to you today that so-and-so miscalculated the money. That's why the budget is off. Now, you are hurt deeply. You are embarrassed in front of the whole congregation. You are upset. You have three choices. This is called um, ruminating, or put the video in. And so what you do is you go off in the corner, you go about your day, and again and again, you replay the tape of that event. He did that to me in a public place. He hurt my feelings. You know? Now you get it all worked out. You keep running it. And now it gets impressed on you and impressed on you. You get sick about it. You feel bad about it. You have three choices. You can avoid that person who said those things. That doesn't work too well. You go to a different service. You try to step around them in a grocery store. You can decide you're not going to stand for this. You can attack them. Go after them. Get even with them. Or you can forgive them. Now, people who are in psychology, they talk about this forgetting business. There's a little thing called the white bear experiment. 
It proves that if you're in psychology and you tell somebody, okay, work hard at not thinking about the white bear. You know what happens? That's all they think about is a white bear. They can't get it out of their mind. So what they come up with is a thing called mindful meditation to help them put things in perspective. And since the thing is about forgiveness, the mindful meditation is instead of thinking about the harm caused them and the damage done, think about God's forgiveness. So for unforgiveness, think forgiveness. It's designed to get you focused on the right thing. It's designed to move you from a place of justice. They caused this. They did this. They got it coming if I give it back to them. To a place of understanding. It's about the Lord. It's about when I have that feeling, we go to the only person that makes forgiveness happen. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. And it helps us think and remember that he died for us, that he gave his life for us, that he redeemed us. So it's not about forgetting. It's about forgiving. God didn't see David's sin. <coughs> He saw his Savior. God didn't see the woman in adultery sin. He saw her Savior. God didn't see the sin of Adam and Eve. He saw their Savior. Number two. Forgiveness is not a mechanism, is not mechanistic about... Um, yeah, forgiveness is not a mechanistic kind of... Thing. In other words, when we think about the cross and Jesus' death, we do not add up how many points Jesus gave and how many points we stand against that and make a collection of all of this and say, well, he did all these good things, we do all these bad things. It's not about that. That's about bean counting. God isn't a bean counter. The cross is this. This is what the cross is. It's a sign from God as to how far he'll go and what he is willing to do to be in relationship with us. That's what it's about. So it's about relationship. That's what forgiveness is about. Like I said to the kids, it's not what you do and don't do. Right and wrong. It's about relationship. So God doesn't think you did this, you have this coming. It's not about justice. And I'm not trying to say that justice is not important. We need the law. The law is important. It shows us what's right about caring for others and what's wrong about doing for others. But you got to know, folks, doing right and wrong won't make uh, David my friend. Doing right and wrong with David won't make him love me. It's about being. It's about what we have understood God in Christ to have done for us. Because he is in relationship. What it says is the same thing I said to the kids. The relationship is bigger than the differences. It's bigger than right and wrong. It goes beyond that. And what happens in that relationship is that God sees us in a different light. He sees us through the light of Christ. Now, there are lots of stories in the scripture that illustrate these things. One of our favorite people in the scripture when it comes to forgiveness is Peter. Now, Peter, he's a bean counter, you know. Well, Lord, how many times should I forget? Seven? Not seven. Well, 
How about 70 times 7? I'll play your game. No, Jesus says, how many? Well, 70 times 7 means unlimited. There's no end to forgiveness in relationship with Jesus Christ. It's always there. Forgiveness means that I have reason to set aside the harm that has someone has done to me. And I will tell you this, and you know it very well. Forgiveness is not fair. Many times when somebody sins against you and the harm is there, you're not going to get back equal for what they did to you. You know why it said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth in the Bible? It was so people didn't get carried away with their punishment. That's what it was. It was for people who count beans. It said, okay, so if you lose one tooth, you get one back. And even that went away with Jesus. So don't come to me and say, it's not fair. I lost this. This happened to me. I got the great harm. Is it? It's not fair. But understand this. It's not fair when God in Christ looks down at you and tallies up all the things that you did to break relationship, to ruin the relationship between you and God, to get in the way of it. It's about mercy. So when I say I forgive the person, I'm understanding the same mercy that I got. What do we say? When we talk to the Lord, remember not the deeds of my youth. Remember your mercy. Remember your steadfast love. That's what we say. Don't count those things I've done against me. Look at me through the eyes of Jesus Christ. Really, if you say it, and I owe credit to David Lowe's and to a guy named Chuck Rickenbach for some of these ideas and the way they present them, everything is about forgiveness. It's all about forgiveness. Now, you remember the story of the uh, woman that broke in on Peter's house when Peter was having a meal. And the woman came in and she kissed him, Jesus, and she, she washed his feet and she cared for him. And Peter said, what do you mean? Come on, you can't, what is, what is this, you know? You just sit there all. And what does Jesus say to him? Peter, you don't get this. I came in, you didn't kiss me. I came in, you didn't wash my feet. I came in, I came in, and you didn't. But this woman, and then he says to her, your faith has made you well, you are forgiven. And then he says, Peter, understand, you want to play that game? Okay, so if you play the game, and you continue to live this way, you'll lock yourself up forever and you go to the nasty part of eternity. Now, there's a parable, remember. And what David Lowe says is he's not condemning him to that. He's saying if you continue to count beans the way you're counting, this is how you're going to live. You see, forgiveness is about freedom. When I forgive, I get free of all the things that I've taken out of the past, that I brought into the future because I've been harmed and somehow I deserve to have repayment. So my past not only is ugly in the past, but it continues to ruin my future because every time I think of that, it gives me bad feelings and makes me not be good. Forgiveness and the woman can help us. The woman has gratitude. 
She knows what Christ has done for her. And she turns that gratitude around on Jesus when she kisses him and washes his feet and cares for him. And people who feel and know and understand what forgiveness is about understand that same gratitude, that same understanding. I, a poor, miserable sinner, am forgiven. They, a poor, miserable sinner, are forgiven. Now, I know, because I probably have my own little list of people that I have trouble forgiving. I think we all have them. One of my kids said yesterday, she didn't think she had one. I said, well, good for you. I, I have. But she said she'd think about it. <laughs> and I know what kind of difficulty that provides for me, the pain it gives me. And you know what? You can tell me all week, all day, all night, as much as you want, God forgives you, and you must forgive the other. And I will tell you, that doesn't work. Forgiveness is not forced. You can't command a person to forgive. It's not something you have to do if you can't do it. In spirituality, we pray, we teach a prayer. Lord, help me to forgive the person that I am not able at this moment to forgive. You see, if we take people and insist on their forgiving, we only turn forgiveness into law. And again, forgiveness isn't about law. It's about mercy. It's about love. It's about relationship. And sometimes it takes time for a person to get there. It has again to do with mind, mindfulness meditation. So I need to keep in mind when I have that sense of hurt, when I, when I have this sense of, of cause, when I'm, when I'm looking for justice, I need to remember what God remembered when he looked at David? Would God remember when he looked at Adam and Eve? Would God remember when he looked at the woman taken in adultery? I need to remember that I am forgiven, that I am loved, that I have God's mercy, and I need to focus on that and let God do what God does in those things. But forcing forgiveness not work. So let's just take a little break here. Okay. What I want you to do, and I'm not going to ask you to volunteer that, think of a person that you have trouble forgiving. I suppose that didn't take too long, did it? Okay. Now, I'm just going to break for a moment. I want you to pray about that. And I will do the same. You pray what you want about it. Okay? Because that's the way prayer works. All right. In the stead, and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Amen.